throughout my career at the European Space Agency, I passed many significant events in ESA's history. Milestones, first attempts, landmarks. Looking back, they may appear like isolated events, similar to a collection of single dots on a piece of paper. I want to share the knowledge that I gained along with my journey while connecting these dots. My name is Paolo Ferri. Welcome to my masterclass. Smart One was a technology demonstration mission. The objective of Smart One was to demonstrate in space the utilization of a novel propulsion uh, technology, ion propulsion engine. And the technology which is used today for uh, Bepi Colombo at that time was still in its first uh, steps. So we decided to send a spacecraft to the moon, which is not around the corner, but it's relatively far uh, to allow the demonstration of this technique. The end of the mission for SMART-1 was dictated by the fact that uh, uh, the, the spacecraft ran out of fuel and it was uh, very gently, very slowly spiraling down to the surface of the moon. It was getting lower and lower. Uh, our flight dynamics experts had predicted that uh, eventually the altitude would be low enough to hit um, a hill about a one kilometer high on the surface of the moon at a very precise moment, which happened to be around seven o'clock on a Sunday morning in September 2006. Just a few days before, uh, in fact on the Friday before that uh, famous Sunday, um, a scientist, an American scientist I think, um, provided us uh, with a better orography, a better map of the surface of the moon. And he told us that, uh, according to his calculations, the spacecraft would have hit the rim of a crater on the surface of the moon in the orbit before, so six hours before the predicted moment of the crash. We had really no uh, alternative information. We didn't know whether he would be right, we would be right. Uh, but this was, of course, a very dramatic moment. It was Friday night and uh, we had invited everybody for the um, end of mission event on a Sunday morning, VIPs, uh, directors. Uh, it was impossible to change the time of this event uh, at that point. I mean, telling them instead of coming in at seven o'clock in the morning to come at one o'clock in the morning. So we had an uh, emergency meeting in our, in our control room and uh, in fact, Flight Dynamics at this point came up with an idea. And um, an idea which was absolutely non-orthodox. We had run out of fuel. In principle, we had no way to change the orbit of the spacecraft. Uh, but they uh, thought, well, there was still some uh, limited fuel of a different system that was used to uh, offload the reaction wheels. So the ion thruster could not be used anymore to change uh, the orbit of the spacecraft. So they used uh, thrusters which were on a different location of the, on the spacecraft, which were there just for reaction wheel offloading. So of course the spacecraft had to be turned so that the thrusters could push in the right direction to accelerate its uh, uh, velocity and therefore increase the altitude. So this was the idea, this was the proposal. Everybody looked around, uh, it looked, in principle, feasible, and then the teams went off to implement uh, this uh, uh, very, very unorthodox solution. And then eventually on the 
Sunday morning, when uh, the previous orbit, the one o'clock time, passed, we saw that the spacecraft had survived. So it had managed to um, fly over the rim of this crater, thanks to the very small change in the altitude that we have managed to implement. And then the happy end was that at the, exactly the predicted time, uh, the spacecraft hit the hill that was predicted originally, seven o'clock in the morning, on the Sunday, 3rd of September, 2006, with everybody present. And uh, yeah, success eventually was achieved. So this is an example of uh, how, uh, on one side, thinking out of the box, um, and on the other side, the flexibility of the spacecraft allows uh, solving a problem which apparently uh, is not solvable. One day, one of the four cluster spacecraft um, coming out of, uh, of an eclipse, uh, cluster went through periodically an eclipse phase, so coming out of the shadow of the Earth, um, at the first contact did not transmit any telemetry. So we basically, uh, our team was sitting in the control room and not receiving any information from the spacecraft. The station was still receiving a radio frequency carrier. So the signal was there. We knew that the spacecraft was there and we knew that uh, it was transmitting. But for some reason, only the carrier. There was no modulation, no telemetry. So our team and our control systems were completely blind. Um, the team did some investigation first, tried to command in the blind the spacecraft. It was clear that when the uh, uh, cluster was coming out of the eclipse and it was sort of switching on gradually all the units, the, the switch on sequence of the units obviously had not worked properly in this state. So this was clear, but we didn't know what this state was. There was no information. Um, so the team sat there and uh, decided, well, we have only one source of information, which is the radio signal. Is there a way we can do some tests by commanding trying to modify this radio signal, the shape of the radio signal, to see whether commands are received and to see whether we can get, get out of this situation. So that's exactly what they, they did. They selected commands that could modify the shape of the radio signal. For example, the height of the radio signal uh, by switching on and off the uh, ranging transponder, you could see that this, uh, this height would change. And uh, so we sent these commands, and in fact, uh, we noticed that the shape, the, the height of the uh, radio frequency carrier was changing. This was very important. It showed that the spacecraft was able to receive commands. This was, of course, not enough, uh, but already a very good step forward. Then they went on with this uh, by sending commands that uh, uh, would activate or switch on the, the onboard computer, and they saw that those were not received. So relatively soon, they could discriminate and they could say, good, the, the space cab is receiving a certain type of commands and executing them, what we would call uh, hardware commands, but it's not decoding software commands. So we knew the problem was not a hardware problem, it must have been something in the onboard computer that was not able to decode the software commands. The team went on with this investigation and by uh, trying possible sequences of commands, it focused more and more onto the status of some relays inside the onboard computer. Relays that we normally wouldn't change uh, before the eclipse, but that possibly would have been put in a wrong uh, position by this slow ramp up of the voltage at the exit of the eclipse. And in fact, by well, looking at the design and by trying various potential uh, configurations, at the end, uh, they came to switch the, um, the right one, so to set up the proper configuration in the onboard computer, fortunately by hardware command, so they were received. And about 48 hours, after the moment that the problem occurred, by working practically 
uninterruptedly in the control room, the cluster team managed to reacquire telemetry. This was, um, of course, a, a big relief, a, an incredible success. Um, and once they had understood what uh, the problem was, they could very easily design a procedure that in case this problem would reoccur, would reset the configuration of all the uh, relays to the right uh, situation. In fact, it happened many more times in the cluster mission because all the spacecraft were periodically going through this eclipse and they were exposed to this potential problem. The story here is again thinking out of the box. Uh, look at the tools that you have and try to get the best out of it. We're normally used, used to our tools is thousands of parameters in the telemetry. At that time, the team had none of them. All it had was the radio signal. But they said, okay, how can we use this tool, the radio signal, how can we get information out of it? They managed, with the incredibly small amount of information, they managed to get out of the, of the dangerous situation. Exosat was uh, a satellite built in the 80s, and at that time, the majority of satellites were built still with hardwired logic. So basically, integrated circuits that would have uh, um, all their functions hardwired. There was no way to reprogram them. But Exosat was the first ESA spacecraft which actually, which actually carried on board a reprogrammable onboard computer. It was not there to drive the spacecraft. So all the logic of the spacecraft, of the platform, was implemented in hardware. This onboard computer was purely designed to do an onboard processing of uh, the scientific data, to reduce, reduce them, compact them, elaborate them so that they could be transmitted in a more efficient way to ground. So only purpose was scientific. We had uh, a dedicated uh, a person, a lady in the team, who was specialist of this computer, could reprogram it, and she was trained to adapt the programs to the processing of, of science. Uh, one day the logic of uh, uh, the um, uh, attitude control subsystem, the failure detection logic of the AOCS, basically failed. Um, and the AOCS was detecting um, gyroscope failures even if there were no gyroscope failures. And since this was a hardwired logic, there was no way to change that. So every time there was a spurious detection, the spacecraft would trigger a safe mode, consume fuel, was interrupt the scientific observation. It was really a disaster. It was getting the mission basically to the end. So the team here thought, well, why don't we use the science computer to implement a very small routine, a more intelligent routine, that uh, uh, will prevent the spurious triggering of gyroscope failures. So this routine was implemented by this lady very, very rapidly in very basic assembler code at that time, where basically the routine would check itself the gyroscope health, and if the gyroscope was actually healthy, it would keep the uh, hardwired logic of the AOCS disabled. But if it would detect that there was a gyro problem, it would enable the hardware logic and then the AOCS would trigger the switch over of the gyro in the safe mode. Since we implemented this, no more spurious failures occurred and the spacecraft continued, the mission continued. So it was a way to save um, a, a problem in the hard, hardwired logic of the spacecraft with the only flexible part of the spacecraft that was there, a reprogrammable onboard computer. Nowadays, all spacecraft have reprogrammable computers. We don't have this problem anymore. But that was the start of uh, this new technology utilization.